I'm in an area of Xinjiang called Turpen. It's notable because it is very, very, very dry. There is actually little to no standing water that occurs naturally um, above ground in this entire community, which makes you question, where's the water from behind us coming from? How do people survive in such an arid area? How do they grow crops? How do they provide for their families? How do they wash? How do they get water? It's such an interesting story that I'm about to tell you today. Okay, so uh, how do people get water in these areas? It was something that I've been wondering for a long time. As a matter of fact, Turpan is well, well known for grapes. They produce some of the most interesting varieties of grapes. In fact, uh, a little bit later in this video, you're gonna see a corridor where they're growing 20 different types of grapes. Uh, on top of growing the grapes, they need to dry the grapes. And of course, Turpan <laughs> is a very, very dry and hot climate. So the drying thing I had no question about. I could see how this place would be a very good place to dry grapes into raisins. But how do you get the grapes to grow in the first place? You need a lot of water in order to do that, and I couldn't see where the water was coming from. That's why this place comes into play. This is a sort of a museum, sort of an interactive uh, area where you can learn about how uh, Turpan uh, and, and a lot of people in Xinjiang get their water for daily life and for agriculture. They get it from something called a karez. These karas, many of them, are over 300 years old. And that's an interesting fact in itself because we're gonna learn a little bit about how they were made without all of the interesting digging tools and, and boring uh, monstrosities that we create to dig our tunnels today. There are over 1,784 of these sorts of uh, um, uh, karas uh, water delivery tunnels all over Xinjiang. And Turpan, because it's such a dry place, has the majority of them at 1,237 of these uh, Karaz tunnels. Here is a actual tunnel. Now, some of these have been sort of restored a bit, so they look a little bit uh, modern. You know, obviously they have some placards and things over them, but the actual uh, Karaz is original here. This one itself is, is over 300 years old and it carries water from the mountains many, many kilometers away, like 20 kilometers away, and it delivers the water from the mountains to the communities in the basin. The water that comes out is extremely clear, extremely drinkable. As a matter of fact, uh, later on in the video, we'll have a drink. Think about it. Somebody had to hand dig this tunnel to bring the water from the mountains all the way down to the villages. Let's take a look at how that was done. <laughs> it's kind of funny that they have a mobile phone charging station in the middle of this, <laughs> this museum. Hmm, technologically advanced in an area that's celebrating a technology that's, you know, so old. Now the people that worked on these wells, the people that made these wells, are of a uh, subgroup of the Uyghurs. They're called Kenko. Um, I, I, I think that the Chinese translation is a little bit different, but the uh, English is Kenkel. Uh, you gotta, you gotta understand. All of these tunnels had to have been dug by hand. Imagine the amount of tool craftsmanship, the amount of just hard work, and what we'll learn in a second is the amount of literal back-breaking work that it took to dig these tunnels. Now the channels were very, very long. They could go up to 20 kilometers in length to deliver water from the mountains, but they also had many vertical. Uh, ventilation wells that were dug in order to provide oxygen and allow the water flow to go uh, fluidly from the mountains to wherever they wanted the waters to go. Some of these vertical shafts were anywhere from 10 meters to 120 meters deep. It's kind of hard to imagine being lowered hundreds of years ago without any sort of like uh, advanced tools or electricity into a well that is 120 meters deep, barely the width of your body. And then you're told at the bottom to start digging in a specific direction. 
Now in another well that might be two or, or 10 meters ahead, another person is lowered down into a well and you're digging towards each other. And you're hoping that if the calculations are correct, you end up meeting in the middle and creating a joining section of this caraz. This is a old replica of a winch that would have sent somebody down up to a depth of about 10 meters. Kind of simple, you had a hand crank and then you'd put somebody there and then you'd have a, a ability to hoist uh, debris and, and things like that out of the well. This guy's uh, disinfecting the area. <laughs> COVID time, such a strange time. <laughs> It's just not a rarity in China to see a man in a full hazmat suit with a backpack of disinfectant on spray and stuff. It's very crazy. Anyways, if the well was deeper and you might have over 100 meters deep, then you'd have to have a pulley system where this would go around and around, pulling up and down the rope as you need it. And then a man there would have his feet on the ground and he would be pushing against a leverage point in order to it's like slowly crank up that, uh, that human that is now digging the well down below at the end of a shift or at the beginning of a shift. And then the rope would connect to a hoist and then you'd send a man down into the depths. Uh, think about this for a second. Not only the actual construction of the Karaz itself, but think about the construction of the actual hole itself. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to dig in the sandbox. You know, kind of a funny story. When I was little, we had a sandbox in my backyard and my parents would say, you know, if you dig deep enough, you're going to get to China. <laughs> I wonder if these guys, well, obviously, I don't think they knew so much about America at the time, but <laughs> could you imagine these guys? Maybe they'd hit America someday. America wasn't even a thing back then. The, one of the interesting things is these tunnels aren't made of, like, soft soil. A lot of them are hard rock. So you're banging away, banging away at a, at a hole that's maybe less than two meters wide, maybe less than two meters tall and slowly and surely you're filling up containers and, and, and buckets and you're hoisting them up and they're discarding them and then they're moving on and moving on repeat and repeat. A lot of these people who dug these holes never even got to enjoy the fruits of their labor, uh, albeit the water that connects it. I mean these were uh, tens of kilometers long. Oftentimes you go through generations before one of these sections or an entire length of the Karaz was completed. Obviously, uh, if, if you could supplement human power on the hoist with animal power, they did that as well. And you'd have horses that would help to hoist the materials up as well as the workers themselves. Now here's where things get interesting. Somebody's singing. I'm not there. Ah, the phone interrupted her. Nichanga. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a map behind me of the uh, Turpan desolate uh, basin here. I mean, this goes on for kilometers in many cases, and it doesn't have any water standing on the surface. So they knew that if they were to dig trenches from the mountains into the uh, areas where they need it, the water would be exposed to the sun and would just evaporate. By the time it got to where it was needed, it would be gone or severely diminished. It gets hot here. In fact, the surface gets very, very hot, baked by the sun. Uh, there was an area I went yesterday by an uh, area called Fire Mountain where the, the surface area was up to 65 degrees. It gets up to 70s all the time. So bear, by burying the water, by burying the channel, you have an opportunity to conserve as much water as possible. So you have these channels, like this one behind me. Um, each one of these lines, this one, this one, this one, each one is its own uh, caraz, its own channel. But kind of an interesting thing, they have to dig these holes. These holes aren't for removing water. They're not like well holes. They're actually holes to provide oxygen and provide flow of air so that they can have the, uh, the direction of the water and the flow of the water going smoothly. Imagine working in a tunnel barely bigger than yourself and you're, you're going through hard rock over excruciating amounts of time and oftentimes all you have is a small port that goes up to provide light from the surface but sometimes you're deeper than 100 meters. 
So very little light ends up penetrating. So they'll light torches here. And I'm guessing that one of the reasons they need those small port uh, ventilation shafts is because if you're lighting a fire deep within the earth, you're going to end up running out of oxygen. So they'll have one person going one direction, and then they'll have another person going another direction. And uh, they're hoping they meet in the center. What they do is they actually line lights up. And they can tell by the direction of the lights what direction they need to proceed further. Think about that. I mean, you're digging a tunnel that's 10, 20 kilometers long, and you're just praying, you're hoping that it's straight enough that your survey crews or whoever is telling you how to do it is, is pointing you in the right direction. And a lot of times, it's just the act of lining up these, these torch lights that you can get the direction of your dig proper. And then hoping that the person that's down in front of you that's digging towards you has the correct direction as well. They could dig about two meters every day. So that meant that if you had one person here working himself that way and another person here working himself that way, they could do about four meters every day. Some of these tunnels were, like I said, over 10 kilometers long, so you do the math. That's a very long time. Also, they had to be graded perfectly so that the water coming from the mountains was at a, uh, at a uh, um, steady pace and a steady decline in order to provide enough flow so that the water would end up where you want it, coming out in the open and end up uh, at an aquifer or a reservoir that will allow the village to take from it. And uh, I mean, this water is very pure from the mountain glaciers, so it was very good drinking water. Hello. Ni hao. <laughs> now this whole area is, has these really beautiful sort of domes uh, throughout the, the museum facility. And the domes are symbolic, actually, because the center point here is the symbolizing a, uh, a uh, shaft, and then the windows symbolize the uh, tunnels that will end up transporting the water. And this one here represents an actual shaft that connects to one of the existing tunnels. The water down below had been built on the same trench that we saw delivering waters to the uh, outside area. And we're going to be able to go down these steps and actually take a view of what went into making these tunnels and what they look like down below. So let's go take a look. Now, as we descend into this tunnel, kind of take yourself out of the video that I'm recording and try to place yourself into the lives of the people that would be hoisted up and down into the shaft. The first thing that you start to feel is that the temperature of the tunnel itself starts to decrease. Now, for sake of the exposition, this area has been somewhat modernized. But make no mistake, the tunnels that I'm going to introduce at the end and the beginning of this area are the actual karas that existed hundreds of years ago. Now, obviously, this area is very big, but how big is the original tunnel? Well, the original tunnels are right here. Now, imagine. Now, I'm 6'2", but the, probably the average height of the person living then here in this area was a little bit lower. But uh, imagine being down below. Now, this is the size of the tunnel. You can see here that people had to slave away, working, chiseling away at the sides, chiseling away at the roofs, transporting substrate backwards to the closest tunnel in order to deliver the substrate up. Not only that, but oftentimes they had to be hoisted over 120 meters down into the earth just to get here to start working. And there was no LED lights to light up their way, just some very, very uh, simple lanterns that were probably <laughs> stealing the oxygen away as you toiled. Pretty, pretty impressive, amazing. The only good thing here is that the temperature here is very, very cool as you descend the weather gets very, very nice. Okay, so just to give you an idea, this is a wellhead, one of the connecting tunnels that provided an opportunity to take out substrate and lower down uh, people to dig the tunnel. Now we're gonna walk along a corridor that's along the length, so the, the water is, uh, the caraz is over here, but we're walking down. And then this is the next shaft. So here you can see, just about how spaced the uh, vertical wellheads are as they connect to the main uh, Carrez tunnel. And then it just keeps on going and going and going. 
They do this a couple of times just to give you an idea of how much distance is between each uh, wellhead tunnel. So as we walk, I'm just kind of trying to show you the exact uh, uh, spacing between the two. And then we're gonna get to the next wellhead, which is here. Now they have a fan up there that's drawing air out. I, I gotta imagine this would be a very, very interesting way to cool your, uh, cool your building <laughs> if you could connect to the wellheads and then draw the cool air from the depths to, uh, I mean, even the, even the depth itself cools the air down, but then you have the flowing water itself, which uh, adds that extra layer of cooling as well. And then there's one more wellhead here, and then we're gonna go into the uh, main uh, gift, gift center for the, for the facility, which is pretty beautiful, as a matter of fact. So this here would represent one of the wellhead uh, points where it would cut into the uh, existing cares um, and then they've built this dome over it symbolically that represents the, uh, the the vertical well hole and then the windows along the outside edge here represent the cares that would cut in from underground it's a quite a beautiful place here as a matter of fact this entire complex is just beautiful and some of the gifts and stuff I, I think I'm gonna buy Eva a couple of things here before I go but you can see the layout of this place has is, is really come to appreciate the, the method that these people devised for delivering water. Can you imagine what this would have done to a community that lived in the desert? This is a game changer. This provided you an opportunity to survive. I mean, water would uh, change a nomadic culture to a culture that could actually grow in an area and then thrive. Without it, you're just chasing the water or chasing the animals that drink it. Now you have the control of the water. And uh, not only can you feed your crops and feed your animals, but you can feed yourself too. Check this out. Now the water is, is spring water. It's <laughs> probably better than a bottled water you might get in the supermarket. You can just come down and drink it right out of the spring. Can't get fresher than that. Okay, so the water can be used for all sorts of different things. And uh, one of the major things in this area is grapes. Now, there's really some really wild structures that I had been seeing around Turpin as we've been driving into the area. And coming here actually provided me a lot of answers to what these structures are for and why they're here. Let's come check it out. And I was so confused at what the purpose of these places were. I thought maybe they were places where people could live, but that didn't make sense. There was too many holes in the wall. And then I thought, well, maybe they just like the ventilation, but it gets hot and cold and very drastic changes in temperature. No way people could live here. I had to have another purpose. There were so many along the side of the road, it was crazy. And then I got my answer. These buildings are designed for a specific purpose, to dry grapes into raisins. So the water comes through um, all of these immaculately built uh, tunnels that carry water from the mountains. They feed the crops and these grapes end up growing luscious. Then they're transported into these houses and hung for two months. In those two months, the situation in these houses are so perfect and the temperature is so dry and the wind blows through and to such an extent that they become raisins in about two months. The, the reason that these houses are necessary is because if they were to block it off, there wouldn't be enough flow through, so the walls have to be porous. But they also have to have uh, protection from direct sunlight because they would dry out too quickly and wouldn't be good. So they found that building these sorts of houses was the perfect circumstances to create a, a, to create a, a, a tasty grape. <laughs> Tarpan produces a huge amount of grapes that sent out all over China. In fact, Xinjiang is a, is a huge grape producer and uh, that's why I was seeing so many of these houses driving in here. This one has been sort of repurposed as a matter of fact and they have a, they have a chair here where you can sit amongst the grapes. You can be Lord of the Grapes <laughs> just in case that wets your fancy. Now this corridor behind me is actually really interesting. 
The vines overhead constitute one of 20 different types of grapes. There's red grapes, there's sweet grapes, there's big grapes, there's little grapes. There's grapes that when they mature are the size of a peppercorn. I didn't know that. Actually, maybe I'll show you a little later. I'll, I'll include a clip of the, of the smallest grapes I've ever known existed. The, the great thing about these, uh, these channels is that they're so deep that they're not affected by the evaporation of the sun. So even when they're uh, irrigating the crops, uh, a lot of the time they're irrigated from below because they don't want as they want to keep as little amount of water exposed to the outside environment above of above ground as possible they they also do some interesting things with these vines they take these vines every winter around november and they unsheath them from the top of this uh, corridor mm -hmm. and they bury them in the channels alongside the roots every, every year from november to march so this has been an interesting tour around a very formal place representing these channels and the steps it took to get them here. From now we're going to go to a actual real life example of a Uyghur family that's using this form of irrigation in their daily life. So we just saw how the karaz were made and a bit of a backstory behind them. And now what we're seeing is the result of being able to deliver that water to areas that would ordinarily not support life as easily. This is a, a Uyghur family that lives just outside of where we were uh, a few minutes ago. The water that is delivered to this property is through those canals, underground canals. Oh, that's them! That's them! And they were young! Wow! That's a guy! Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Shahar Jati. Shahar Jati. My name is Matt. Mm, yeah. <laughs> a little bit easier. <laughs> There's so many different uh, different ways to live in different countries, in different cultures, doing different things. I mean, these people are retired, hanging out. Oh, I hear music. We might have to add to this episode a little bit. Father here is Uzbek, and then uh, mother here is Uyghur, and uh, happy family. 